I'm about to present Dr. Sarah Roy, who is going to give the keynote speech here tonight. Sarah Roy works at the Center for Middle East Studies at Harvard. She knows more about a subject than many of us here. Her latest book, which came out this year, is called Gaza Unscienced. And I'm now going to ask Dr. Sarah Roy to come up and give us her keynote speech. All right, well, thank you all. I'm delighted to be here. Before I begin, I just want to um, congratulate all the finalists. I want to say that your, each of your presentations uh, last night were, each was profoundly, profoundly uh, inspirational and impressive. And I'm really delighted to be here to celebrate with all of you tonight. So thank you. I want to begin, first of all, by expressing my profound gratitude to the Palestine Book Awards, to all the people involved with it, to Nassim Ahmed, and to uh, Victoria Britton in particular for inviting me here today. When Victoria asked me to deliver <clears throat> this keynote, I must admit that I struggled a bit over what I should address, particularly as it concerns Gaza, which has been the focus of my work and which always uh, lies deep within my heart. What can I say that is not already known to everybody in this room? And what can I impart to Palestinians who live a reality I do not? That is, after more than three decades of engagement with Gaza and the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, is there something different, possibly new, that I can contrib contribute? I decided to draw this uh, brief address from a manuscript I'm currently working on that weaves together the different threads of my life and my work, reflecting on what I have learned since I began my research as a young doctoral student in the mid-1980s, in 1985, to be precise. These threads include my family history as a child of Holocaust survivors, <clears throat> the role of the Holocaust in my life, my understanding of Judaism and Zionism, my experiences under the occupation, and the struggle for Palestinian human rights. At their core lies an ethical imperative of a shared, conscious, and moral humanity. Growing up as a child of parents who survived the horrors of Auschwitz has been a defining feature of my life, and it could not have been otherwise. I lost a very large extended family in the Nazi ghettos and death camps in Poland. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, a sibling not yet born, people whom I never knew but always loved. My father Abraham was one of six children and he was the only one in his family to survive the war. He was, he was one of seven known survivors of the first Nazi extermination camp in Halno, where 150,000 Jews were murdered including the majority of my family on both my mother's and father's sides. He also survived Auschwitz. My mother, Taube, was one of nine children, <clears throat> seven girls and two boys. My mother and her sister, Franja, were the only two in their family to survive the war, except for another sister, Shoshana, who had emigrated to Palestine in 1936. My mother and Aunt Franja had managed miraculously never to be separated throughout the entire war through seven years of incarceration in the Pabianitsa and Lodz ghettos where they survived murderous roundups, followed by Auschwitz and the Hauptstadt concentration camps. I grew up with stories and images. I was told about a family I did not know, but who, who have always been a part of me, much like Mossab's descriptions last night of his grandfather. I was told about life before it was destroyed and how it reemerged re after about the Holocaust and the meaning of survival, about our enormous capacity for evil and good, for barbar barbarity and nobility, about hope and possibility. Some of these stories are in my recently published book, On Silencing Gaza. My history <clears throat> and my memory, memory, lived and imagined, also include my long engagement with Palestinians, Israelis, and the occupation, all of which are inseparable from my family history. 
As the French anthropologist Didier Fassin has written, quote, history is not merely a narrative, but within, but is inscribed within our bodies and makes us think and act as we do, end quote. As a child and young adult, I would sometimes try to put myself in my mother's and father's place, which of course was impossible. And while their stories and those of my aunt remained an indelible part of me, they also remained safely abstract. Yet through my decades of engagement with Palestinians living under an increasingly merciless occupation, this abstraction was, over time, given a certain palpable and corporeal texture. It was given a very spe specific, carefully delineated and humanizing reality, despite the vast differences in context and scope, and however lacking in symmetry and equivalence between my parents' experiences and those of an occupied people. The stories I carried were awakened in different ways by my experiences with Palestinians, forging deeper connections between my past and my present. This is a theme, among others, that I explore in my current writing, and I want to briefly address here. It is a theme that has many expressions, and I shall focus on just three, terror, hunger, and humanity, that have stayed with me over the last almost four decades. Terror. There were many stories my parents told me about terror and the barbarism and unspeakable cruelty and inhumanity that produced it. I shall not describe them. Instead, I want to tell you about my friend Nadia, a young girl who lived in a refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. In her, I saw what terror looks like for the first time in my life. Nadia forced me to come face to face with fear in its most acute and paralyzing form, and I've never forgotten it. <clears throat> It was during the first Intifada, 1989 to be exact. I was living in Gaza doing research for my book on the political economy of de-development. A friend of mine, Talal, had arranged for me to live with friends of his, a married couple whom I shall call Ziad and Abir, in their home in one of Gaza's refugee camps. They had no children and Ziad was seldom at home, so Abir arranged for a neighbor to a neighbor's daughter, Nadia, to stay with us. And at that time, Nadia was in her late teens. Ziad was a local hero in the camp, having spent considerable periods of time in jail for his political activism. He moved around a lot, but on this particular day, he returned, to, he returned home and the four of us had a meal together that evening. After the meal ended, I vividly remember Ziad securing the many deadbolts on the front door. Nadia and I shared a room, which was next to Ziad and Abir's. I had a camera and several lenses with me since I spent a great deal of time documenting what I saw, especially inside the refugee camps where some of the worst abuses occurred. Once we were in our room, which was small, windowless, and sparsely furnished, I asked Nadia if I could take her photo. And she started to laugh, demurring at first, but eventually she agreed. While I was focusing my lens on her face, we suddenly heard Israeli soldiers running in the alleyway alongside our bedroom wall. Both Nadia and I instantly stopped what we were doing and remained very still, hoping they would leave. Suddenly, the soldiers were at our front door. One of them began pounding on the door, screaming in Arabic for Ziad to open it. He did not and his refusal, refusal clearly inflamed the soldier who started, started pounding with greater fury, screaming obscenities in Arabic, followed by threats against Ziad and his family. I immediately pulled the film out of my camera and hid it among my clothes. Frantically, I began looking for places to hide my camera and my lenses because I was afraid that if the soldiers found my equipment, Ziad and Abir would be arrested since in those days it was considered a crime by the Israeli military to harbor a foreigner in your home inside the camps. I hid my lenses under pillows and between towels and the camera in, inside a pile of blankets. Once I had hidden everything, which took less than a minute, I turned to Nadia. I was shaken by what I saw. She stood upright in the middle of our room, unable to move her feet as if they were cemented to the floor. At first, her body stood erect, rigid, 
almost as if rigor mortis had set in after a body dies. Her breathing was imperceptible, perhaps fearing perhaps it would betray her location. As the soldier's screams became louder and more enraged, Nadia suddenly began to shake uncontrollably, her entire body convulsing with fear. What I remember most were her arms and her hands, which shook with an intensity I had never seen before. This is what terror looked like, I thought, and it frightened and shocked me. I tried talking to Nadia, but she could not hear me. She stared past me and was clearly somewhere else. I tried to coax her towards the corner of the room, but she would not move. As the battering and screaming and profanity grew in power, Nadia seemed to lose all control over her body. I put my arms around her and literally had to drag her to the corner of the room. I then placed my hands on her shoulders and with some force pushed her downward to the floor until she sat. I sat next to her, wrapped my arms around her and held her close, my body forced to shake by hers. Ziad never opened the door and eventually the soldiers gave up. After they left, an uneasy quiet encased the room and I could feel Nadia's body slowly relaxing. We were both exhausted and fell asleep next to each other on the floor. My experience with Nadia was one I've never forgotten. It had an enormous, unerasable impact on me. The terror that seized her and made her immobile reflected the immobility of the space to which, to which she was confined, not only in our room or in the refugee camp, but in Gaza itself, speaking to a kind of impermanent, dispensable personhood and violent endurance. With decades of experience since my time with Nadia, I continue, I continue to ask the questions to which her story and that of so many other Palestinians gives rise. Why must Nadia be the embodiment of the other, her continued confinement and, and internment, key markers of that otherness, sustained by invisibility, unknown and unknowable without testimony? Why is she considered gone? Why was she not worthy of protection, her life made safe from destruction, and if lost, deserving of grief? No life transcends endurability, as the philosopher Judith Butler has argued. Pain and suffering and fear are not relative, but real and total to those experiencing them. Yet to dispose of what Butler terms, quote, the sensuous parameters of reality itself, including what can be seen and what can be heard, end quote, makes it impossible to understand the suffering of others, which is clearly the point. <clears throat> Absent such understanding, who are we as Jews? Can we be normal when we seek remedy and comfort in the dispossession and destruction of another people? Observing the windows of their houses through the sights of rifles, to quote the Israeli poet Almog Behar. Can such acts, in this case terrorizing a young girl, be necessary for the sake of the Jewish people? A question posed by Edward Said in his 1989 letter to Jewish intellectuals. Hunger. Among the many stories I was told by my family, the most recurrent and, and agonizing centered on hunger, unimaginable hunger. It was Tel Aviv in 1996. I was in the home of my beloved Aunt Franya, whose fear of hunger translated into a powerful need to husband bread in her home at all times. We used to eat bread and butter for dessert with a cup of coffee. On this particular day, something happened that had never happened before. Franya ran out of bread. I was standing in her kitchen while she was preparing breakfast. She opened the bin on her freezer and her kitchen counter where she kept fresh bread and found just a few pieces. She then opened her freezer expecting to find two loaves, but found none. For a moment, she stood motionless in front of the open freezer, trying to process the want that she had long ago defeated. She closed the freezer door and sl uh, slowly and turned to me with a look of controlled panic in her eyes. She began to tremble. Hugging her tightly, tears welling in my eyes, I promised to run out immediately and buy her bread. There was a big supermarket literally two blocks from her home 
in one of Tel Aviv's busiest shopping areas. But of course, the abundance of food just yards from her home could not, for those few unbearable moments, mitigate her pain and fear. Even after I ran home with a bag filled with bread, she remained apprehensive and uncertain. Gaza, 2016. It was my last day in Gaza after an intensive week of work. I was in a UN bus heading toward the Eris crossing point with several UNRWA employees. We were driving along one of Gaza's city's main commercial streets. The bus stopped at a red light at a busy intersection. I was staring out the window and noticed below me in a parallel lane, an old man in a car. He held some pita bread in his hand and was attempting to make a sandwich with some other kind of food. Suddenly the old man looked up from his sandwich and motioned to a young boy who was about 11 or 12 years old. The boy was standing on the sidewalk peddling packs of cigarette. He carried in a wooden tray that was clearly too big for his very small frame. The young boy approached the old man and spoke briefly. I assumed the old man was going to buy a pack of cigarettes, but instead the young boy handed him two individual cigarettes, which appeared to be all he could afford. The old man paid the boy, and then in a gesture that the youngster did not expect, the man threw half of his pita sandwich into the cigarette tray. The child hurried off, and I kept staring at the old man, thinking about his simple act of kindness. As our bus began to move, I looked up and saw the young boy standing at the corner of the intersection, ravenously eating his half of the pita bread. He ate with a hunger that startled me. Bread, hunger, deprivation. Without equating their suffering, my aunt and this little boy in Gaza are linked to each other not only by the occupation, by, but also by what it has wrought after more than five decades of oppression. It is, not, is it not policy-driven hunger and want more than settlements and walls that binds Palestinians to Jews, revealed most painfully and shockingly in a policy now gone of restric restricting the amount of food allowed to enter Gaza? And deprivation is not just about hunger, it is also about place and, and the certainty of that place, which was never fully resolved for my aunt or for the little Palestinian boy. What constitutes an acceptable response to such imposed visceral deprivation? It must begin with what I, as a Jew, have been told I must never do, and that is claim a relationship between my aunt and the child in Gaza, embracing that child as part of our moral universe and refusing his transmutation into an instrument of war. As Butler argues, quote, the subject that I am is bound to the subject that I am not, where life itself has to be rethought as this complex set of relations to others, end quote. Yet this is precisely what Israel has attempted to destroy, a shared experience and civil theology, the social con conditions of persistence and flourishing, and modes of belonging within and across groups with the aim of making disassociation sacred. Despite the variance in their lives, my aunt and the Palestinian child deserve and require the same ethical and principled response to their shared humanity, a response the occupation has from its inception rejected. And this response ultimately must emanate from a desire to reconstruct the world in common and not selectively, to disrupt established notions of we, as Butler has argued. It must emanate from a sense of belonging to the world equally, and as Hannah Arendt argued, quote, from a capacity to live with others precisely when there is no obvious mode of belonging, end quote. Humanity. <clears throat> If there is one theme that has been threaded through all my experiences in Palestine, a theme that is the strongest, the most consistent, and unrelenting, it is the dehumanization of Palestinians and their continuous struggle against it. The act of dehumanization finds a range of, a range of expressions from disdainful tolerance to condoned erasure, where entire families in Gaza are, according to the Israeli journalist Amira Haas, now being targeted and killed. Throughout my years of research among Palestinians, I have always looked at the ways in which human beings rise from loss and refuse to be destroyed by it, 
an imperative clearly rooted in my own family's history. For my family, remembering survival and rising from loss were not about horror alone, but also about kindness, altruism, and repair. My aunt told me the following story. Whereas I was the stronger in the ghetto, your mother helped me survive in Auschwitz. Without her, I would have died. She saved me because she hoarded and rationed our food, our few pieces of bread, spreading it out over time so that I had something to eat each day. Had it been up to me, I would have eaten it all at once and starved. Your mother also gave me her bread, sometimes part of it, sometimes all of it, which I ate as I cried. Do you know what this meant? to give up your bread to another under such horrible circumstances. Bread was life. People beat each other for it and some were killed for it. Your mother gave me her bread, an act of selflessness that I will never forget. For my mother especially, what remained at the center of her memory and, the, and was the belief that her survival, if she were to survive, depended in part on remaining who she was by holding onto kindness, compassion, and devotion against all attempts to take them from her. Giving her bread to her sister, smuggling food to others, hiding children in the ghetto from deportation to death camps, even struggling to view her oppressors as children, was how she resisted dissolution, how she remained visible, how she preserved agency and intimacy and struggled against spiritual erasure, and how she remained human and humane. That her example found different expressions among Palestinians is of course not surprising, but there is one experience that my husband and I had that has never left me, and one I remember thinking at the time my mother would have wanted to share. It is a story that I've told before, but it bears retelling here. My husband Jay was with me in Gaza during the first intifada. He had just completed his training in general surgery and <clears throat> volunteered in a local hospital as a trauma surgeon. After several weeks in Gaza, Jay needed a haircut, but couldn't find a barber. A young man, Mohammed, who lived in the Shati refugee camp and worked at the Marna House Hotel, where we were living at the time, somehow heard that Jay needed a barber. He told us about his friend, also named Mohammed, who was an excellent barber in Shati camp. He insisted that Jay get his, get his hair cut by his friend, and we happily agreed, and Muhammad arranged it. The barber's home consisted of three rooms. He was married with nine children, and they were very poor. Muhammad and his wife, Najla, welcomed us with the warmth and grace that had become so familiar. Immediately, Jay was seated, and a plastic cape was wrapped around him. The haircut was moving quickly, and I remember thinking, and I remember thinking to myself, our visit will be over too soon. Suddenly, Muhammad stopped cutting. Jay and I looked at each other, <clears throat> not understanding why. Najla then came in with a stack of large folders, which he gently placed on Jay's lap, asking if he would look at them. Jay opened the top one and pulled out an x-ray. Najla explained that these were x-rays of her children, several of whom were deaf. Then, <clears throat> all of her nine children filed into the room in a single row. One by one, each child sat dutifully on Jay's lap while Najla identified the corresponding x-ray from the pile. Each of us understood that Muhammad and Najla were not seeking a miracle cure, but reassurance that they had done everything they could for their children, given their meager resources. And when Jay gave them that reassurance, we could see the relief on their faces. After the ninth child had been seen, the, after the, ninth child had been seen the haircut resumed, but stopped again about 10 minutes later. Najla went to the door near to where we were seated and opened it. One by one, people from the camp entered the room, some with their x-rays for Jay to examine, others just to talk. Muhammad looked at Jay and with kindness in his voice said, not only for my family. As each person entered, Muhammad would introduce him or her. Dr. Jay, this is our neighbor X. He would like you to look at his x-ray or he has a problem and wants your advice. I went to the door where Najla was controlling the flow of traffic and looked out. I remember seeing a line of people standing along the side of the house, some holding x-rays, waiting patiently to see Jay. His hair, Jay's haircut did not resume until three hours later. I do not remember how many people he saw, but it was not a small number. 
After the last person left, Najla disappeared and Jay returned to the barber's chair expecting the haircut to continue. Instead, Najla brought us a tray full of food, which I kept thinking this family could not afford, but insisted we partake. After the meal, Mohammed finished cutting Jay's hair about four hours after we arrived. Jay and I agreed before the visit that we would give the barber a good amount of money. When he reached for his wallet, Muhammad adamantly refused to take the money, and his refusal was sincere. After a gentle tussle back and forth, Jay took the cash, placed it in the pocket of Muhammad's shirt, saying, this is for your children. The cramped carceral space in Shakti camp in which this family lived echoed in its own distant and muted way the carceral space to which my mother was long confined. I pictured my mother with me in Muhammad and Najla's home. She would have worried about the people who hadn't been seen, asking Jay if there was a way he could find them. She also would have insisted on washing the dishes Najla used to serve us and would have done everything she could to make certain that before she left, there was enough food for their children. Throughout my life, I've both imagined and encountered the loss of humanity and its reclamation and its amazing resilience, even in the face of unthinkable cruelty. I shall conclude by reading an excerpt from a poem called Natural Resources by the late Adrian Rich, who I actually had the honor of meeting many, many years ago. It speaks to all people searching for justice and for whom renewal remains not only a wish, but a necessity. Adrian writes, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age perversely, and with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. A passion to make and make again, where such unmaking reigns. Thank you.